Well, Friday night was uh, Pathway Night at San Juan Stadium. We had almost 100 Pathway members there, and a good time, I think, was had by all. Everything that I thought could go wrong, looking at the, well, this could, this could happen. None of it happened. It was really wonderful. I said, well, we could be in the sun. It was the shade from 6 o'clock on. Well, uh, we won't really have a place to eat together, but it was a beautiful uh, gazebo to eat with a view of uh, the field. And, uh, well, it's all-you-can-eat um, barbecue. Well, that could cover a multitude of sins. The barbecue turned out to be hot dogs and hamburgers, so the fact that it was real meat was recognizable and it was pretty good. And, and uh, even one of our members caught a foul ball. I mean, what more can you uh, wish than that? The home team uh, crushed the opposition. Yep. Uh, we, uh, the manager of the opposing team came over and talked to us. Some of the ball players came over and talked to us because uh, of Dwayne Almer, a son of this church. You heard him a few Sundays ago, who's chaplain there. He has a 15 minute, every Sunday, 15 minute uh, uh, d- devotional uh, chapel with a home team, then 15 minutes again with a visiting team, then 15 minutes again with the umpires, and they think they're going to add staff. So he's uh, busy on Sundays with the team, and what a wonderful ministry to these largely uh, young men, and uh, I hope that uh, you will continue to own that ministry yourselves and pray for them and pray for Duane and one of the other uh, ministries of this church. Seems like only yesterday... It was yesterday that uh, I started to get to know this church and to love you, and that has happened, and I do, and next Sunday is my last Sunday with you in this capacity, and then a couple Sundays before your new pastor comes uh, to be with you, and that season of your life together starts, and I'm excited with you and for you. I re- one, one of the things I regret, uh, this is the only church in decades and decades and decades that I've served largely without Stephanie. Uh, she was, uh, it was on the schedule, she was handing over her elementary school re- responsibilities to the church uh, that we're members of in January, and that handover never happened. And uh, so she continued there, serving there. She's been here two or three times. She's, she's promised to be here uh, uh, next Sunday, and she will, but you've missed the best half of uh, the Shouse team. Uh, when Jamie Dew, president of New Orleans Seminary, was preached for us, we went out to lunch afterwards with his retinue of five children and a wife and uh, his mother-in-law, and they were all traveling together for the Southern Baptist Convention. I met his wife, and she was charming and gracious and had so many interpersonal skills. I said, you were, you were born to be a first lady, and her mother who was traveling with him, spoke up. He said, you're right. He said, you know, they interviewed Jamie and they offered him the presidency of New Orleans without even meeting the major reason that they they should have offered him the presidency, my daughter. (laughs) And she was right. Well, no, Jamie had uh, skills in himself, but uh, what was said about uh, that uh, duo is certainly said about Stephanie. She's going... Uh, the last five or six weeks, it hasn't been responsibilities of the church. It's recovering from the spleen injury, and uh, it's been slow but steady. She, she can do about one thing a day, and five, five weeks ago, it was 10 minutes to one thing a day, and that's about an hour, maybe an hour plus, and uh, so she's getting better slowly. Uh, patience is not one of her virtues. But uh, we expect that she'll be here next Sunday, and we look forward to that together. If I had scheduled this um, with a lot of intentionality, we would have, I would have strategized it so we finished Ephesians next uh, Sunday. And I realized I, I could have done that, but I just want to let the verses fall as they would, and we've done that. We're in the third chapter now and next Sunday, but we will be ending... If I planned it, I'd actually like to end on this. I didn't plan it this way, but we'll be ending next Sunday with what some people say is the mountaintop of the letter. I'm not sure that's true. The first chapter is awfully wonderful too, but it builds up to this fabulous prayer, my favorite prayer uh, in the book and in possibly all of uh, Paul's literature, for the church. And uh, we will look at that next Sunday, but we open the third chapter this Sunday, our 
Our intern, Josh Harder, is not with us this, this week. He is off in the East Coast, my vicinity, Winchester, Virginia, uh, to marry off another of his friends, and he'll be back with us uh, next Sunday, and we look forward to, to that. But the responsibilities of reading the Word of God fall back on me. We're in Ephesians, the third chapter, beginning with the first verse. Pay special attention to the first words. You'll hear they're important. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I write before in brief, and by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has been now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which... I was made a servant according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power, to me, the very least of all saints. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable, unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for the ages has been hidden in God who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities and the heavenly places, this in him and through faith in him, that we may approach God in freedom and in confidence in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. Father, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I asked you to pay special attention to the beginning of that rather long passage. For this reason, he says... And next week, as he goes into his prayer, we will say he, you see, he uses the same phrase, for this reason, I kneel and pray for this reason. It's as if he's beginning to go into that now and takes a discursus, for this reason, I, Paul, and then next week you'll see he's ready to go on, I kneel and pray for you, my beloved church, but he doesn't. He takes another journey, and it's as though he's reminded, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner. And he ends this long discur excursus in verse 13 with, I don't want you to be discouraged. It's, it's as if before he prays, he is reminded what he knows, and he knows, the hearers of his letter knows, that he is bound in, in chains. He is a prisoner of Rome. He is about to be uh, on trial for his life before Nero. And... Uh, what kind of credentials, what kind of authority does one who encourages his recipients of the letter who is himself bound? I think Paul is reflecting, I better make certain that my recipients are not needlessly discouraged by my condition. 
and also that I might present credentials of one who, though a prisoner, actually can give witness to the power of Christ and the victory of Christ. And so off he goes on this 13-verse uh, side tangent. What do we make of his conditions in light of the promises that are replete in Scripture? Every time I go to the hospital, I pick those kinds of verses. Psalm 121, the Lord who made heaven and earth will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. And the sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul from this time forth and even forevermore. Scripture promises that not even a hair on your head will be harmed. What do these promises mean? In the light of the suffering that all, almost all Christians, all Christians experience, not all the time, but all Christians experience and that Paul is experiencing now, what do these promises mean in light of the cuts and bruises that life brings? I think these questions are the reasons for Paul's detour. He begins to pray the prayer for the church that we'll look at next week, and then he pauses when he hears them saying this, the, the phrase, for this reason I, Paul, and then he identifies himself as a prisoner. The fact is that difficult things happen not only when you're a Christian, but sometimes because you're a Christian. Paul is not a prisoner because he broke the law, he's not in prison because uh, He's done something wrong. He's in prison because he's a follower of Jesus Christ. It's one thing to say, I'm a Christian and I did something wrong, which we do. It's another thing to say, I'm in prison because I'm attempting to follow Christ. Hear this. The Bible teaches, and we know from experience, that the more consistent a Christian life you live, the more likely you are to suffer. I might have shared with you before, I, I haven't had many surprises in Christian ministry. By and large, it was what I looked forward to and what I expected and what I knew. I've had two surprises, though, in ministry, and one of them is, I may have shared this with you before, that as I have gotten to know people in Christ's family, almost without exception, the most joyous Christians I know, the most faithful Christians I know, the most uh, dependable Christians I know, when I, you just scratch the surface and get to know who they really are, they have suffered greatly. Suffering isn't the opposite of joy. It can lead you in another direction, but it also can deepen you and lead you into Christ, which of course where this sermon is going. If you refuse to sleep with people before marriage, if you give a lot of your money away, if you identify yourself as a Christian, if you refuse to lie in a situation in which it would be helpful for your business to do so, if you maintain that God intends for you to live your life by standards that differ from the prevailing culture, it is likely that something unpleasant is going to happen to you. Or let's state that same insight in reverse. If you have not grappled with suffering for Christ's sake, it is possible that you have not lived a consistent enough Christian life. Many who really live a consistent Christian life come to know difficulty. Different difficult things can happen to you while you are a Christian, and they do, and they can happen to you because you are a Christian. One of my students said to it, when I came to Christ faithfully and joyfully, I was serving as a waiter. And it was a custom at my job that we didn't report our tips. And after I became a Christian, that's a little thing. I, I didn't do this out of self-righteousness. I just did it because I wanted to be a follower of Jesus. I started, I started reporting all of my tips. And my fellow, my fellow workers and my boss resented it. As a matter of fact, because of it, I was fired. And I lost a lot of my friends. Now... Suffering comes in many different stripes. In uh, preparing for the sermon, I remembered a book by Elizabeth Elliot. I'd forgotten about it, uh, but I looked it up, and it's titled A uh, Path 
through suffering. And I might reproduce, I have five notes of just one section of it. She says, here are the different ways that Christians can suffer. They can suffer for their own sake. They can suffer for the sake of the church. They can suffer uh, for the sake of unbelievers. And they can suffer for Christ. And I have five pages of single space notes on the different ways she breaks up the suffering in each one of those. I find it very instructive. For example, we can suffer for our own sakes and so that we can uh, be encouraged, so that we can bear fruit, so that we can be tested, so that we can be shaped into the image of Christ, so that we can know God deeper and better. And three pages for that one thing alone with scriptures in them. As my gift to you, I might run it off and make them available the path past. Uh, you need to know, I think you need to know about the book, A Path Through Suffering by Elizabeth Elliot. It would be perfect if she had titled it A Pathway Through Suffering. But they come in those four areas. We can suffer for our own sake as God molds us into the people we are meant to be. We can suffer on behalf of the church. We can suffer on behalf of unbelievers. We can suffer for Christ's sake and Probably the remedy to those sufferings are a little bit different, but um, Paul gives one pathway here, and I don't want to say one size fits all, but I think the sizes all participate in the pathway Paul gives here. Now, he is clearly suffering here, and although he says, I'm a prisoner for Christ, I think he's really suffering for the Gentiles. He's suffering for unbelievers in the name of Christ. That's his particular uh, path of suffering in this place. What, so what answer does he give? What is his pathway? Let's look first at what he doesn't say. Paul does not say the answer is to become cynical. Um, life is difficult. What do you expect? Life isn't a bed of roses. Be realistic about this broken, terrible evil world we live in. Now, it is an evil world, as we've made of it, but Paul is not cynical. Neither is Paul a romantic. Paul doesn't say things aren't as bad as you think they could be. Look, there is uh, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Things are going to be all right. Now, granted, in Romans 8, one of my favorite verses of Scripture, he does say, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, but he's not romantic about it. He does say they are going to work together, that God is strong to say that he does redeem and he does transform all things. You can count on that, but he's realistic. It may not, and I might add, he doesn't put it this way, but my experience says it it probably is not going to be on your timetable. God is going to bring things to pass, but you might not see it when you want to see it and the time you want to see it and there are going to be dark days you are going to walk through. God is, uh, Paul is not a cynic. That's not his answer. And he's not a romantic. That's not his answer. Neither is Paul a stoic. Stoic is a kind of uh, a paganism. It's a pagan philosopher. It says, uh, buck up. Don't expect better. Life is going to be difficult, so just walk through it. Make the best of it. Um, You're you're never going to have a rose without thorns, so don't expect much from life. Ironically, although Christians are to be realistic about suffering, the answer is not that we are not to expect a lot from life. We, as Christians, are to expect more from life than anyone else. Christ said, I come to give you life which is abundant and life which is eternal. Have great expectations for life. They will not be sullied and you will not be disappointed in it. So Paul does not counsel cynicism or romanticism or stoicism. What does he do? What is the answer that Paul gives that I'm suggesting even though there are many varieties of suffering that that this one size fits all in in various ways is relevant to all of them. Uh, the, The answer Paul does give is to counsel us to look at suffering the way he does. 
looking at suffering the way he does is the antidote to discouragement. And the way he looks at it is to recognize that his life is not identified by suffering. It is identified by Christ. I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ. I am not bound to this Roman guard. I am not in chains to a Roman guard. I am in chains. I am bound to Christ. And that transforms everything. No matter how bad life gets, and it does, it can get bad. This is a fallen, wounded world. And evil does befall us. The answer to suffering is not that God sins evil. There are things that God stands against, that he sent his son to the cross to save us from, that he hates. He hates evil, but... Scripture does promise he will redeem and use and transform everything no matter what happens to you. It is not the end. My favorite, my fa- I don't have a favorite verse of Scripture, but I do have a favorite verse with reference to suffering. And it is that verse in Hebrews where it says, we do not yet see all things subject to him. We live in a world in which we do not visibly always see Christ as Lord. We do not yet see all things subject to him, but we do see Jesus. We do see the answer that God purposes and promises. We do see life as it is intended to be, and life can be transformed even in the midst of our suffering if we identify ourselves as being chained and bound to Christ. I, Paul, a prisoner not of Caesar's, not of Pilate's, not of Rome's, but for Christ. So the, the clanging of the chains, the leer of the Roman guards don't identify him. He knew that all things happen at God's permission, at God's sometimes passive and not active, but nonetheless his ordination. Paul is saying that it is his understanding that Christ had him in jail, not the Romans, and that Christ had him in Rome as part of the fulfillment of his plan to preach the gospel to the whole world. So in verses 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, Paul says, God has helped me to a under, deeper understanding of his purposes. I am to be a steward of the mysteries. We've come across that biblical insight from the very beginning of our time in the parables together. A mystery is some, not something hidden. It's not a detective who doesn't done it. It is something that's open and available but cannot be known well, without the key. And uh, then there's this great phrase that Paul says, the mysteries, the secrets are unfathomable. That's a compound word coming from out and from tracks or footsteps. So they are footsteps or tracks which cannot be found out. We can't find the the source, we can't find the ending that, that Christ's mystery of his gospel is unfathomable and he has been made a servant of that, a steward of that. Of the many things that stood out to me about uh, your wonderful next pastor, these words leapt out to me. I think Josh has been captured by the fact that uh, the joy and the thrill and the honor of being a steward of the unfathomable mysteries of Christ by grace, captured by grace. It, It isn't his choice or his doing, it's the goodness of God. By grace, he's looked into the wisdom of Christ and the beauty of Christ and the depth of Christ and the truth of Christ and been captured by it and been thrilled by the fact that by his grace I can be a steward sharing this to others. I try not to report conversations I've had with a church member without talking to them first. I looked for this church member ahead of time. It's anonymous. I'm going to go ahead and do it, but my apologies. It's really about someone else, but Friday night of the game, Last week, uh, we, we honored and we said goodbye to Dan Matz, and what a joy it was uh, to work with him. And one of our church members, we were talking about Dan, and uh, she said, you know, I appreciate Dan as a staff member. I worked with him, saw him close, but it was at Windshape that I really saw his heart. 
he got together with one of our, our young elementary kids. She doesn't come from a Christian home, but she's been brought to the ministry here. And I saw Dan just talk about his walk with Christ and his joy in Christ and the decision he made as a young man. And I saw Dan's heart and that young lady, not then, but that night, that very night, alone in her room, after being witnessed to by Dan, gave her life savingly to Jesus Christ. Dan had the privilege of being a, by grace, of being a steward, a servant of the mystery of the gospel. This good news of God's provision for people. I had a student who said to me, he'd been on a beach uh, mission trip, and he'd come back, and he'd had the privilege of being around, and uh, through his words, the Holy Spirit wooed somebody to Jesus Christ, and he saw uh, the joy and the look in that face, and he said, I... I want to spend the rest of my life trying to see that happen again. And if it never does, it will be worth it for what I saw in that mission trip. That's what it means to be a steward of the mystery of God's grace. Look at verse 8. Paul writes to me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable, the unfathomable riches of Christ. What cannot be tracked out, footprints that cannot be fathomed. Ah. So Paul is saying his antidote to evil and to suffering is to change the identification of your life. Be transformed by being bound to Christ. Paul is saying, don't look at your circumstances that are discouraging you. At least don't be defined by them. Be realistic about them. Regret them, grieve over them, take them for what they were. There are things that God hates in this world that he stands against. You can hate them too. But what you are really after is the cause of your discouragement. He says, once you realize that the things that you are really after is just to please Jesus, the one who has given you all things, then you need to be willing to do whatever he wants you to do. Um, one of my, we'll leave it down there. <laughs> oh, that looks ugly, doesn't it? We'll pick it up. One of... Uh, we went through a season at Gateway Seminary where fewer and fewer people were entering pastoral ministry. And um, there was a reason for that. Students, we, we asked students about that, and students said, um, I just want to do whatever Jesus wants me to do. And uh, 10 years before, that would have been a cause of concern. Because we were to think they were hiding out or didn't really know what they were doing. Or, but there was a season, that's who our students were. They really meant that, whatever Jesus wants me to do. But we uh, decided that was a, should be a short season. Actually, we weren't having enough people answering the call to pastoral ministry. And we thought there was probably something wrong. We might have been wrong, but we thought about this a great deal. Something wrong in our culture that... People weren't willing to step up and take the responsibility and the hardship and the heartaches and the difficulty to be a leader, to, 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 to shoulder the responsibilities of a family of faith, that people were hiding out from that. And so we started to put the call, the charge, it's God's call, but it is His call for a pastoral leadership and pastoral responsibility, and that changed a bit. And people like Josh and uh, others that you consider for the pastor of, uh, of this church heard that call framed that way and answered the call uh, to pastoral ministry, the privilege of being stewards of the mysteries of the gospel before, before uh, the people of Christ. Uh, being bound to Christ transforms how we encounter suffering. You suffered this much for me, I can suffer 
this for you. Some suffering does become because of the evil of life, but Paul says God's promise, though it is not to eliminate suffering, it is to redeem and to transform it. My favorite explicitly Christian film is The Hiding Place. It's the story of Corrie ten Boom. I know many of you have seen it. Uh, she and her Dutch family in Amsterdam hid Jewish families during World War II, and they were successful for a long season, but then they were found out, and some of the family was killed. Corey and her sister were sent to Auschwitz. In one memorable scene in the movie, Corey is called in the commandant's office. She's a bit of a rabble-rouser. She's obviously a leader among the prisoners. And the commandant wants to break, come, bring her in and to break her. And there is Corey. She is in uh, ill-fed and in weak condition and in prison garb and is uh, just about with, without any sign of dignity or worth. And she is brought into the commandant's office, which is full of symbols of confidence and power and strength all over. And in this remarkable moment, the commandant who's trying to break her looks at Corey and says, So, do you still believe your God is watching you? And Corey Ten Boom looks back at him with a look of an eagle in her eye. And she says, yes, I do. And I also believe he is watching you. And the camera cuts to the commandant's face, and rather than all this arrogance and self-confidence, you see panic and an unmistakable look of fear cover throughout his eyes. To suffer for Jesus is to get rid of your self-pity. It means to realize you have a wonderful opportunity to have your faith deepened and your humility deepened. I'm not a prisoner of anything in this world. No matter what befalls me, I'm God's prisoner. And because of that, I'm his servant. Uh, we sent Dan Matson off to Minneapolis and I was reminded of a layman I had in a church I served. He was a fireman, kind of a man's man. He went on to seminary and became a Lutheran pastor in Minneapolis. And, uh, but when I knew him, he was kind of a lay theologian. He, he, he thought deeply about a life. He thought a lot about men's ministry. And he said, you know, there are only three kinds of men in this world. I think we can extend it, men and women, but the way he said it, three kinds of men. He said there are men and women, uh, that have never been broken. And for them, they are their own God. And then he said there are people who have only been broken. And for them, other people are their God. And then there are men who have been broken and been found by God. And for them, God is their God. I don't know how you are suffering uh, this week. Maybe not at all. I hope that's the case. But we have all lived long enough to know that suffering does come. And your sufferings may not be the particular suffering that Paul is talking about here, but the antidote, the remedy is going to be similar. It is to be bound by Christ. Whatever your prison is, if you allow your life to be bound to Christ, to be identified by Christ, to be captured by Christ, to be a servant of His grace. That prison can be changed into a palace for Him. And the end of this whole long excursus can be yours. For this reason, I Paul a prisoner. Da, 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 da. Then you might not be discouraged. Paul doesn't want his church, his people, his recipients to be discouraged in whatever comes to them in life as he moves into the prayer for them that we will see next week. Our Father, you have made the world and all that is.
for your delights and for your glory. You have called us into a deep love relationship with you and have made that possible through the cross of Jesus Christ. You have made the way of the cross the way of your love. And we confess that we have missed the mark for which we were made and we have lost our way. We thank you for loving us and lifting us and saving us and we pray that we might be faithful followers of your way and might be fishers of lives to your love. Use us to let others see your light and experience the wonder and joy of new life in you. We pray for our country and our, her leaders. Give us and them wisdom to be a source of peace and promise in your world. Help governments to be promoters of justice and not persecution, of opportunity, not oppression. Restrain forces that seek to kill and steal and destroy, and we pray for the day in which your kingdom will indeed reign on earth as it does in heaven. You are the land that takes away the sins of the world and the door through which we walk for life abundant and the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, who is the author and finisher of our salvation and the true vine upon which we are the branches. In you alone there is life and fruitfulness. May we not be prisoners of this evil age, but prisoners and servants of your grace. In the name of the one who came and taught us to pray, saying, and let me invite you to pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory and the honor forever and ever. To you be the glory and the praise until you come again and then eternally. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.